were living in uh, you know apartments in London in London and uh, all the and in the same sort of ha thing. And we needed a little bit of privacy or get away, make some music, you know, have a little. So we rented a house in Roehampton. It was owned by an Indian gentleman who used to cook curries for us, you know, while we were out and to, we'd come back and the house had stinking curries for like three years. But, um, yeah, so we used to have a lot of great parties there. And, uh, you know, everybody was there. Tom Jones, Beatles, Stones, you know, Eden Kane, remember him? And uh, just the animals, anyone you could name in the music business at that time would be at one of those parties. And, you know, some fun went on. I was, we used to make this punch with uh, like everything, a bottle of everything, you know, and then, and of course in Germany you could buy this like pills and speed, you know, could, so you put a bottle of them in and everybody would be up for three days having a ball, you know. I came out one, look out the window one morning, Epi's uh, Bentley was on the on the garden wall, <laughs> like like this, and he was asleep like this at, behind the wheel. This is Brian Epstein. Yeah, mm. Brian Epstein was was a regular visitor to our parties, and uh, like I say, you know, it was all our fault. We used to get people too drunk, and uh, but we had some great laughs, you know. And that again, we just got to meet everybody in the business that way. You know, I mean, people would come by like. You know, to play us their their demos, like John Lennon and and uh, George on their way home, because they all lived in that area at that time, would come and play us the demos, you know, and just to see what we thought about. Then we would play our our album to them. We'd all we'd all got pally in the clubs in those days. The Adlib Club. We invented uh, Scotch and Coke one night, you know. Um, Was there a game called Snape? Did you invent that? Sniping. <laughs> Well, I don't think I, I don't think we invented it, but it was that, you know, just pushing people to the limit. Really, it was, it was kind of, I don't know how, how would you describe it? It, it, it? Testing people to do little things and it, knuckle fights and stuff like silly things, you know, and see how much you could push people and throwing things at people, uh, drinking, you know, all that kind of thing, knife throwing. <laughs> Any, any kind of sort of wind-up games that you would get into, which would turn into total chaos. And sometimes, you know, <laughs> people end up in hospital getting stitches, but it was all in good fun, as we say. But uh, I remember coming to one of your parties. Yeah. I was violently ill, actually. <laughs> I was sick out, I had to be carried upstairs by uh, a friend. Well, I'm sorry that we... But it's great fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> to anyone we, we ended up in hospital, we, I'm very sorry, but they were great parties and they would go on for three days and, and you know, it was great because everybody kind of relaxed with everyone and knew everyone and they were, uh, they were the early days of rock and roll in, in London. You were saying that the house, I don't know if we got the story, but the house was actually robbed while you were in America, so perhaps we could repeat that story a bit. Well, when we went to New York, I'd noticed some shady characters hanging around the house, you know, standing against a Jaguar, a blue Jaguar, I'll remember it by down the road. And I, you know, I was always a bit worried about leaving equipment in the house, although it was a rented house, we had stuff there. But anyway, we went to America and when we came back, the whole house had been gutted, except for Ray's flute above the fireplace. Um, the one he played in Nights in White Satin, I do believe, but you know, he was the only one who ended up with anything left. But uh, these, these were early days, pioneering days for, for groups that had communal homes, shall we say, you know. I think that they started inventing sort of gated communities after that, <laughs> to keep the, the people away from the rock bands and vice versa. <laughs> You mentioned that uh, you backed Sonny Boy Williamson on, on uh, tour, didn't you? And, uh, yeah. Was there other artists, other uh, visiting blues artists like to, um, When we did the uh, Chuck Berry... Shopify Be DeSanto as well. Yeah. Well, when, when we, uh, we started doing that backing musicians, that period of our lives was purely all the, the, the Little Walter, Sugar Boy DeSanto, Sonny Boy Williamson, as I mentioned, um, 
and a couple of others I can't quite, but they would come across as uh, the art, marquee artists uh, agency would bring them across and we would be one of the backing bands that would go out with them and of course we did TV as well as a result of that with these you know and to me that was the real beauty of uh, you know being in a band because you could just kind of be influenced by all those different styles and, and uh, it, it, it taught us a lot, you know, like I say, I really started picking up and Ray started picking up the harmonica a lot and using it in our stuff a lot more. The fact that we'd done the Beatles tour, that we were now doing a lot of shows with Brian Epstein's artists, and but, you know, again, he was the Beatles manager. So we, obviously we didn't get as much attention as we got when we were just with Ridge Pride to start with. So it was a little bit like, you know, we were late, put out to rest a little bit, you know, out to graze. Um, and eventually that didn't work. But uh, at the time, you know, and we did the Jimi Hendrix tour and we at shows, and or I did later, sorry. Um, but we got to know all those people. And as I said, um, Robert Stigwood did the first Chuck Berry tour. I always remember the first day we went for the sound check to that. And he was sitting in the audience and we were playing and he said, turn it down. And I didn't know who it was like. And I said, this is way we, the way we play, <laughs> you know, like it or lump it kind of thing. And of course, when the audience came, it was perfect. You know what I mean? It was just because it was empty. And ever since that, we kind of bonded a little bit, you know, me and Robert. So, um, and hence the Ginger Baker thing, which came later. But again, Robert and uh, Brian Epstein were putting the Bee Gees thing together, so we were put on the back burner a little bit there. So, again, you know, that all contributed to me sort of thinking, oh, I want to go off and do my own artist thing, you know, grow a beard and, like, wear some, you know, silly clothes and go and go underground and play folk music. You know, that's the way I was in those days. I just didn't want to put me be in that sort of pop star bag, you know. Did you feel still that, you, that kind of gypsy feeling of uh, wanting yeah, to be just, an instrument, you know, or Just kind of just do your own thing more. and this, Because, you know, the whole thing about the, the business is, is of being, you know, a star is like alien. It really is. It doesn't matter who you are. And, um, you know, you just want to keep going back to your roots a little bit. And then, I think, but in the long run, that helps more, you know, to round you as a person and to, and to get yourself, what you're really trying to say musically in every other way, across, you know, rather than just, oh, we've got to make the payments on the new mansion, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> to me, that was all, please, you know. The thing about the Wins trip was that it was like starting a new band very quickly becoming a big band because of the public um, attention that was cast upon us. And then being able to do the stadiums, which I never got to do with the Moody's, you see what I mean? So it was like my first kind of world tour um, and doing it on that level of, you know, private planes and great hotels and all the rest of it and traveling basically the world, Australia. We won't go into Japan. But that was, even then we were supposed to go to Japan and our visa were revoked because of previous stuff. When we finally did get to Japan and he get, gets stopped and then that was again, okay, now what do we do for two years? You know, we've got to get visas and we obviously studio again. So you add all the things up and it was time for me to make a move. You know, and plus I had to go and live out of the country because of tax reasons at the time and it just wouldn't have worked. That's all there was to it. We never fell out, there was no big fight. It was just, again, time to take the trail, you know, the gypsy trail. So, but you know, during, all during that time, I remember we, we bumped into the Moody's again one night at uh, Buddy Holly um, night, because every year we used to have a Buddy Holly night. Because Paul had, had acquired his uh, publishing rights. So I met all the crickets and Mary Elaine and all these people. Over the years, it was great. Well, anyway, there's Ray and, and Mike and everybody. You know, at this Buddy Holly. Uh, I think it was a film, Buddy. That was it. They were showing the film. 
and they all turned up to that. And then Ray says, oh, you've got to come to my house. I've got five acres in Isha, and you know, we have the fishing and all this going. I did eventually go around there and see him with Tony Clark a couple of years later. I got pally with Tony Clark after that, funny enough, because he had a boat on the river not far from where I used to live, and he had his studio, so I was there, like, working in his studio. So we called Mike and, and uh, Ray up, and one thing led to another. We were, we were visiting him, you know. So it circles, you know. The good thing about the, the, the internet, of course, is that I've never had a website, which is, by the way, dennylane.org, just in case you forget. And I'm getting in touch with a lot of people, you know, old fans, people who know all the stuff on the Moody's and Wings and stuff, you know, I'd forgotten about. So they would have been good doing this interview, actually. But there you go, and it's great to have that new tool. You know, I love, I love websites, and I love to be able to find out what everybody's doing. Contact Ginger you know, bang, 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 all the people I know, and uh, you don't have to be there, but you're still in touch with everyone. So, you know, and I'm selling, the, you know, CDs and stuff, and, you know, we're putting up artwork, and it's just good fun, you know. It's a lot. It's the way that the media Well, works. yeah, but you're in control of yourself more. You know, again, without going into too much detail, when, when you've got a million managers and a million this and that, and publishers and whatever, you know what the hell's going on. So this way you're more in control of your life and after you've been through all that, believe me, you want to be in the driving seat, you know. So it's nice to have a little bit of that.